So uh, thank you for uh, joining me at this quite early hour in the morning. Uh, I'm afraid you also just get up, got up, uh, but we dive directly into a quite complex topic, which we try to simplify. So this talk is about reuse. Reuse tries to simplify licensing code and also declaring copyright and so on. So the idea here is um, that we want to make it easier for people to use free software and to license free software or open source code. And um, this is uh, made possible by reuse, which is a set of best practices, basically, and also tools that simplify all of this. A few words about myself. My name is Max Mehl. I work for the Free Software Foundation Europe, the FSFE, and we are a charity that empowers users to control technology. In this presentation, we will first uh, have a look at the whole sphere of issues that we have in the field of licensing, which some of you may also perceive either as a user, but also as a developer, as a reuser of third-party code, or um, also as a package maintainer, which some of you might be. So we will have a look at these issues that you might have and at the solutions and the principles that reuse gives. We will manually make a whole repository reuse compliant and conformant with the best practices, have a look at the tool that reuse offers and also the API. And last but not least, I will give you a few pointers for next steps in your career or path for reuse. And I hope that some of you in the BSD community will also adopt reuse for their projects. Oh, doesn't work. Okay, so this is how a very simple repository might look like. So as you see, very simple. We have a C file, we have a make file, a readme file, so text files, and we have here two JPEG images. And let's assume in this example um, that the images are not by us. Uh, so we took them from a third party. So how would you normally tackle this issue now? Well, most people add this license file that you can see here. Um, this could be let's say a BSD2 clause license. But that isn't sufficient, right? So first of all, we have one license file, but we have stuff from under two different licenses or even more, we don't know. Like if we add a library, an external CSS file from someone else or on a different copyright, then we run into issues. How do we do that? How do we make clear that these pictures up there are under different license by different copyright holders whose whose conditions for reuse we should um, respect, right? Yeah, now it gets complex here with these things. It could also be that, for instance, the, the C file contains code by other people. So in this case, there are several solutions and all of them are rather, I would say, non-ideal. And we have a few additional issues with licensing and copyright and all of this. And some of you may already have stumbled upon them. So most prominently, we have missing information about license and copyright of your own code or also of third party code. So either the user or even yourself as a developer don't know anymore about the license and the copyright, whether something is compatible, whether you can, for instance, make a BSD package out of it, because as I know, not every license is allowed to be uploaded or to be used in a BSD distribution. And also reusers, like if you're a developer and you share your software with other people, they can also reuse it, use it in their own code. That's a, the great thing of uh, free and open source software. And it may well happen that they overlook your chosen licenses. So perhaps they see a license file, but perhaps they don't and they just ignore it. They just copy a file from, from the internet from a public repository. And this can happen for all files or also for individual files. Like, let's say you have a third party library in your repository from a different copyright holder, perhaps under a different license. And the reuse just assume, oh, well, that's from this person who just uploaded the code in this repository. Uh, so I take him or her as a copyright holder and oh, I just take the general license that I somehow find. But that might not be correct. And as I said before, how to deal with multiple licenses and there's also the issue of license ambiguity. Like, you know, there are different license or versions uh, of BSD licenses, but most prominently also GPL licenses, version two, version three. 
only this version or later versions or AJGPL or like all these variants and exceptions that you will see. You should somehow communicate that in a clear way. And everyone who gets on board on the project, maybe a BSD distribution or some other free software open source project, all of them need some sort of training how to deal with this ideally. Like they add some code, how should they add their copyright? They take a third party library, how to do that? And overall, we have a lot of conflicting best practices, right? So we have organizations that propose some ideas how to solve some of these issues. We have some distributions like the Debian project. I'm sure also within uh, uh, BSD projects, there are also some best practices. And unfortunately, most of them conflict. And they often do not solve all the issues that we see while still making it very simple for developers and users. So that is why uh, before 2017 or in 2017, we asked ourselves, how can we make licensing and copyright easier for everyone? Easier for everyone, for users, for developers, for reusers of code, for package maintainers. And how can we really keep it simple without like creating another big standard or big best practice that just conflicts with everything else? And the result of that was reuse. So here are some of the principles of reuse. So we want to make it easy, as I said, to find copyright and licensing information for every single file and repository. And that's probably something that is quite unique to reuse, that we target every single file and repository and not like one or two license files that somehow say which licenses are available in this repository. We also avoid silos. Like there are some projects, some initiatives that somehow try to find out the licensing and copyright information, but they store it in a database somewhere else or even in a web service. What happens if this database is not available anymore? Or if the web service is down and you don't have internet? So this is a silo and we want to store this information that I just covered inside of the repository. And we want to make it readable for humans and machines. So for humans, that's quite uh, obvious, so that a human developer can just see or quite easily see uh, a file and say, well, this is under those license and copyright holders. But also for machines, like we have a lot of cool tools that scrape repositories, find out whether everything is compatible and whether some files are missing. And uh, yeah, so that should also be readable for them. And overall, we did not want to reinvent the wheel. So we had a look, a really strong look at all the initiatives out there. And we want to be compatible wherever possible. But sometimes we also have to set up our own rules. And I hope and I quite am really sure that uh, this is for the better. And last but not least, and this is the most important thing for us all the time, we want to make licensing and copyright easy and fun for developers. I know this is a tough topic, this is a dry topic, but it's so important. It's important that we respect the licenses of developers, that we make clear our terms of reconditions to other people, to companies, to users, to other developers. And it's important that this is possible for every project size, so that you don't need a legal department behind your back covering you and fixing your issues, but that you can also do this for the one person project or for a small community. So these are the principles. And all of this is solved by let's say three simple steps that the reuse best practices propose. And I will now guide you through these steps. First of all, rather manually, but later we will also have a look at the tool that reuse offers. So this makes things a lot easier. So the first step is to choose and provide licenses. So let's say you have a new project. First of all, you should think about, really think about how to, under which license you want to publish your code. Um, that's up to you. We don't make any um, any recommendations or any like uh, preconditions. You can choose licenses for free and you have to provide them. Like you have to provide the full license text in some way. The second step is probably the most work intensive one to add copyright and license information to each file. If you start with a project from scratch, that's quite simple. If you have an existing project, the more files you have, the a little bit trickier it might be, even if you have a, or especially if you have a long history of the project. 
or let's say uh, you take over maintenance ship for another project. And of course, you, you would just have to dig a little bit into it and find out what was the licensing and copyright history. But once you've made it, it's quite simple to maintain. And the third step again is quite simple. You're asked to confirm reuse compliance with a reuse helper tool. So as I said, I will now go into this process to make you understand it in principle, but also um, later, as I said, we use the tool for this, which is much simpler. So first step is to choose and provide licenses. So as I said, you choose the license and you're asked to save the license text inside of a licenses directory. So that's quite rather new for or with a reuse. So traditionally you had a file called license or copying or something else. But as I said, it might become tricky if you have two licenses, three licenses in the project, which is very common. So there are also different conventions. We say, let's set up a directory for this, a dedicated directory where all need license text files are stored in. And the trick here is that we name them after the SPDX license identifier. What is SPDX? SPDX is an initiative, meanwhile, under the Linux Foundation. And I would say their main contribution is that they have a list of licenses, of a lot of licenses, and they gave each of them a unique identifier. So for all these different versions of BSD, GPL, but also like other common licenses and very uncommon licenses, they have a unique license identifier. And if there's a license which is not on the list, there's also a standardized way how to mark this so that you have some kind of an identifier. And in this example, we are rather back to the, um, to the example from the beginning, from the screenshots. We say, well, we start with a BSD2 clause license here. And we have the licenses directory. So let's start with this. That's your main license or your license for your code. Now we label the files inside of the repository with this information. So ideally, as I said, we want to have it as close to the file as possible. So inside of the repository. And for this, we have two, let's say, tags. For the license, we use the SPDX license identifier tag. So here we are now in machine readability. Like if a tool sees this and the string behind, it can guess or it can say under which license the file is under. So we don't need these big uh, license notices or so. And we have the copyright holder. Here, traditionally, it was rather common to use just copyright with a C symbol or something else. We suggest the SPDX file copyright text. Again, here we are at machine readability, um, but both are supported. So in the example below, let's say this is the C file. We have it under BSD2 clause, and we have two copyright holders for some reason. It's uh, Jane Doe, and it's also FUBAR. And both of those strings are supported. You can have multiple license uh, copyright holders and one license identifier, where you can also say you have two licenses or it's dual license or something else. So what can you do if the file itself is not editable? So you cannot add text on top of it, like a JSON file or also a picture. So the first is to uh, create a separate .license file. So let's say we have a picture, cat.jpg. You create a plain text file called cat.jpg.license. And inside of this text file, you can just add the same information that we've seen before. In this example, it's now under CC by 4.0 license because we took the image from someone else, namely from the create artist. So this works quite well if you have a number, a few number of files uh, which are not edible. Now, let's assume you have a directory full of JSON files or a directory full of icons, 500 icons. What do you do then? Of course, you could create 500 additional .license files, but I see that this is not really practical. So for this, we adopted the DEP5 standard by the DBM project. Um, so this is the way how they label in one file or mark the copyright and licensing of all files in a package. And we just adopted it and said, well, here you can bulk license files or files that you could not edit directly. So let's say in this example, you can scrap the first five uh, lines. We have now all files in the IMG folder, 
which are now under the copyright of the Crane Artist under the CC BY license that we've seen before. So that's another clever way how to label copyright and licensing for your files. And with this combination, the header, the .license file, and the .dev5 file, you're quite easily set and can label all files. Um, a small teaser, we are also working on an additional format since we see that the .dev5 format is a little bit strange, opaque, um, not so well fitting. Um, I will come to that a little bit later. Then the third and last step is to confirm reuse compliance. So you can install the reuse helper tool to check for missing information. The helper tool is a Python tool, quite easily installed, uh, quite lightweight, uh, which can also be used in CI pipelines, by the way. And you just run the reuse lint command within your repository. And it goes over every single file in a repository, which is not ignored, for instance. Um, and it checks whether for every single file there's copyright and licensing information available. And in this case, in this very simple repository, we have only six files. And uh, we say we have here now used licenses, uh, CC BY, the BSD2 clause, but also CC0. We will see that later because we say, well, we have one additional CC0 file, for instance. And the last line is the most important one. It says, well, your project is now compliant with the version of the real specification, the current one. So, great. In the end, your repository might look a little bit like this. So we have on the top, we have the .license files for uh, the, the pictures. We don't have the .dev5 file in this example. We have a number of licenses. Um, in this example, it's uh, GPL 3.0, um, just from the screenshot. In this case, it would be your BSD2 clause license. And you have the other files where you cannot see licensing information from the outside because we wrote the information inside of the files as a header. So to wrap it up a little bit, what are the specialties of reuse? What reuse brought new into the game? So we have the license text file stored in the licenses directory. I would say that's a huge gain because now you can see on one uh, side of the eye which licenses are available in your repository. You don't have to click in the license file or trust on heuristics or on <laughs> proprietary platforms like GitHub to tell you which licenses is in there, you can just see it from the outside. Then we're quite special in the way that we um, we uh, recommend or we require that every file shall contain some sort of information about copyright and licensing in either of the three ways that are just uh, highlighted. We offer alternative for, for uncommentable files that was not existent before, and we provide unambiguous copyright and licensing information. So you no longer from the outside as a user, but also as a developer and package maintainer, no longer are unsure like, what was this li what was the license of this file that I just copied from the interwebs. No, you just know it now, once you label it. Over the course of the years, like we are now in the, or completed the fourth year of reuse, we developed a number of components. First of all, we have these best practices. So that's the core of reuse and also quite formal specification. This is ready to be integrated by communities, but also by industry. Then we offer to lower the threshold, um, a tutorial and, and an FAQ. So you can go on reuse.software, you see an example repository and can just follow the steps, which we also go through now. And a large FAQ, which is not only focused on reuse per se, but also explaining what is licensing, what is copyright, how does this all work, and some other frequently asked questions. So have a look at it also if you're generally interested in the topic. And we have the set helper tool. So with this, we support developers in making their projects reuse compliant, and we try to automate or semi-automate a lot of things. And I'm uh, very confident that we now can run a demo I uh, hope the demo gods are with me today of the tool. The text size is okay. Right. So I will now go 
again under this example repository and show you how the reuse tool simplifies a lot of things. So let's first have a look at the whole repository. Again, we have a git ignore file, a very simple text file. We have these two uh, images, the JPEG files. We have a make file, a readme file, and uh, the C file. And with a few commands, we make all of them reuse compliant, or the whole repository reuse compliant. So first of all, let's check the lint status of reuse. You can see, well, we have missing copyright and licensing information for every file here. So no file carries any information. And because of that, the whole project is not compliant with the reuse. We will change that now. We use the add header command and say, well, now we label the C file, the make file, and this markdown file with a copyright holder on the Jane Doe. Let's assume this is us and license the BSD2 clause. And the tool detects automatically the license or the, the file types and also the comment style. So we will see here with a diff command that it added now to the make file, to the readme file, and to the C file the correct information, like these two texts here, the file copyright text, and also the license identifier, and in the according uh, comment style of the file type. So now these files are labeled. Now we take over um, the, the image files. So we have now all files, we say all files here in the IMG folder are now by this great artist, which we took from the internet, for instance, under CC by 4.0 license. So I say it again, this, these strings here are by the SPDX project. So you can see on spdx.org uh, slash licenses, I think, all the different types of uh, licenses which already have a tag, which is a lot. And well, we use now understand this. And you can see here it created an additional file. Let's have a look at one of them. Or let's see, yeah, we have these two files here. Let's have a look at the uh, uh, the content of the cat file. Um, and we can see here the same text. We have the file copyright text with a create artist and this license identifier. So we take now the last file, which is a git ignore file. And we say, well, it's so insignificant. Um, we don't want to uh, have any copyright in it and, uh, well, make it just really usable. Could also be a picture and you say it's very close to the public domain, for instance. You say it's insignificant. So for this, we suggest the CC0 license um, and we just add the header here and it's now, well, having this information. So what do you think? Are we now reuse compliant? I mean, now we labeled every single file, so we should be good, right? Unfortunately not. So we have here missing licenses. The tool detects that we have the BSD2 clause, we have the CC BY license and also the CC0 license in these files. So these files carry the information, but we have missing licenses. Of course, because we didn't download the full license text of all these uh, three um, licenses. Now we could, of course, go to any website on Creative Commons, but also on a BSD project, trying to find somewhere the the license file or copy it from another project. That would be extra work, but the reuse tool automates this. Just say reuse download dash dash all. And with this, the, the tool just downloads all the licenses um, or the license text files, uh, which are used inside of the repository. You could also say, well, I just don't want to download an additional license and give the SPDX identifier afterwards. And since we have internet, we downloaded all the things here. And now we are fully reuse compliant because now we have all the three steps completed. We have the license text files. We have labeled all the files in the repository and we now checked it with a reuse tool. And as the cherry on the cake, you could also create an SPDX um, bill of materials. Um, probably not really useful to most of you if you're working as a compliance officer in a company or so that might be useful. Uh, it's very simple for the reuse tool to do. Um, yeah, it's a bill of material. 
that's it. And this is the tool. And of course, um, you can do a lot of things with it, uh, especially in larger repositories, uh, thanks to the wildcard feature. And uh, yeah, you can automate a lot of things as just a small um, look at the, the features that the tool has. You can also participate in the tool, of course. I would later show the the links to the repositories and yeah, participation is very welcome. Um, we already have a lot of automation going on. Uh, yeah, I just see the chat. I don't follow it uh, during the talk. Um, it's licensed under, uh, like the main license here is uh, GPL 3.0 or later. Uh, probably that's not ideal for you BSD people. Um, it also contains code of other uh, license holders. Of course, it's really compliant, so we can just see uh, the whole license information. I um, will now go back to the presentation. Great. And well, these are now the three components that we have, and we have a last component or another component, which is the API or the batch. So the idea here is that we don't want people to always have to install the reuse helper tool, although it's quite simple, um, to check whether a repository is reuse compliant. And we also want that people can show that their repository is reuse compliant. I mean, that's a big step, especially if you, if you have a larger project. And for this, we created basically reuse as a service, you could say. You can register your project online and get a dynamic batch that continuously checks whether your project is still reuse compliant. And also here we have a demo. Okay, demo is a little bit uh, too much. I will just show you how the API service looks like. Here we go on api.reuse.software. And um, well, what we can see here already is the already uh, compliant projects that we have, which is currently, oh, 750. Uh, it's growing quite fast. And you can see all the here rated after the last check or sorted after the last check. We can see here um, this project. We can say, show me this information about this project. And we can have now a, um, a current check or the latest check of the Reuse API about this project. This could be your project, by the way, as well. And um, we see here the, the lint output that you already know. And uh, we have this batch which you can copy, copy the markdown code for and just add to your readme file, for instance. And quite important, we are not bound to any um, special uh, code source forge. Um, so you don't have to use any proprietary software. Basically, we support everything which is Git. Um, we are uh, currently working on also supporting Mercurial. Also here, contributions are welcome. Also the code of the um, API and everything else is of course also free and open source software. And uh, to register, you just go here on check my repository. You just enter your name and email, which is to confirm that um, we have a valid person here. And um, you add your project URL. As I said, we currently support Git. And well, then you get an email, confirm it, and you see the link to your last check output. Add this to the uh, readme file or somewhere else, and it continuously checks whether your project is still Reels compliant. So that's really great and very simple. Um, but of course, if you want to check the real status um, during your um, your uh, development phase, like for a pull request or so, um, I would always suggest um, to, um, to include it in CI pipelines. So uh, we have Docker, images, GitHub actions, whatever. It's quite simple. You just run the reuse lint command at some uh, step and you can see, for instance, with a pull request, a merge request, whether something is still uh, reuse compliant. So going back to presentation. We're almost done. Okay. Yeah, sorry for the, all the switching here between the different screens. Oh, doesn't you take mine? Oh. Sorry. No. Okay. 
All right. So um, I just want to give a short outlook on the outgoing, uh, ongoing developments in the uh, Reuse project and initiative. So of course we are current, uh, continuously working on the tools. Uh, we want to improve the tool, also add more automation um, for the Reuse helper tool, but also with the API. Again, here suggestions and also contributions are very welcome. Everything is developed in the public. Uh, we work on the specification and here especially we, we um, want to add another possibility to bulk license files with a reuse YAML file, which you can have one or multiple files of. And this reuse YAML file is in the YAML format, so easier to parse than the dev5 uh, file format. And um, well, it's more flexible in a sense. And we also want to enable snippet declaration. So let's say you copied a larger bunch of code from Stack Overflow which is always under a CC by SA license of some sort under a different copyright holder. And if you want to mark it, which you should, then uh, this is currently rather complex or not even working and not supported by tools. And we will also want to support this. And, but of course we have to uh, coordinate a lot here with the other projects that we work with. Then most importantly, I'd say um, is to integrate reuse in different platforms. Um, so that it's easier f to use with different uh, version control formats, but also um, like, let's say, source forges like GitLab, GitLab GitHub, Gitia, so that it's more like a reuse check by default, in, ideally, and also with other initiatives uh, in the whole license compliance field. And we want to spread the word. I would say this is most important. So we want to support communities, but also companies with adopting these best practices. Because the more people use reuse, the easier it is for everyone. Like let's say you want to reuse code from a, a third party project and it's already reuse compliant. It's very simple for you to respect the copyright and also the license by this third party. Because you can just easily find out which license, which copyright holder you can copy the file or contents from the file and you're good as long as you're license compliant, of course. So we want to spread the word here and this is also why I'm speaking to you today. And I hope you help me with spreading word in the BSD community. Speaking of people who use reuse, who are the adopters of reuse? That's quite hard to say, because since we don't have a central instance or a need to register somewhere, we know of these uh, 750 plus registered API projects um, that are reuse compliant. Then uh, the FSFE works in the next generation internet project as a consortium partner where we help these projects who are, which applied successfully for funding by the European Commission and which help to make the internet a better, safer, more privacy friendly world uh, place. We help them to become reuse compliant and already did so with uh, more than 100 projects. Then the quite well-known KDE community uh, changed their policy or contribution guidelines to reuse and they already made their frameworks basically the, the basis of uh, most of their tools are already fully reuse compliant. Then we have the Linux kernel, which is, I would say, to 70% uh, license uh, reuse compliant already, which is quite a success, uh, given the very long history of the whole project and also the quite complex licensing situation with all these exceptions, drivers, and companies which don't exist anymore. Um, so here we are roughly at 70% and they are still working on it. And on the more corporate side, which is also important, uh, we know that reuse is part of the policies of Siemens, the European part of Huawei, SAP, LifeRay, Linux Foundation, Energy, and probably many more. They don't tell us. We just find out by randomly most of the time. But it's really great that we now have more doctors in general. And I hope that you will become one too. So what are the next steps for you if you are now interested in reuse? Well, the easiest one is to sign up the mailing list and take part in the, all the discussions that we have in the project. So this is rather low frequency, so no harm done for your inbox. Um, and we develop reuse quite in the open. So all these specification changes, also tool like larger steps with the tooling, we announce on the mailing list, we can discuss there. So if you're somehow interested in all these topics, just sign up the mailing list. Then the next easy step is to make one of your projects reuse compliant. You don't have to start with the biggest one. You can take a personal one or a smaller BSD project and just try out reuse for this. Then a cool step would be to integrate reuse in your community. 
all these BSD communities, communities around the BSD uh, ecosystem are very Im important and all in general operating systems, distributions. So it would be great if we had more adopters here and also have the input and feedback by them. And it would be great if you can make a start here. You can, of course, contribute code to reuse, to the API, to the tool, but also textual-wise to the specification, FAQ, and so on. And most importantly, please help others to adopt reuse. Once you understood it, help others to make this. We are just a smaller organization, and we need like the, the mass effect by other helping each other um, to make licensing and copyright much simpler than it is today. So with this, um, I end this talk. I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, if I cannot answer all the questions, please just ping me via email or on social media. Join the mailing list. Join the repositories. Yeah, thank you very much for attending uh, my talk. So um, how do we do this with the questions? In the shared notes? So, so I would just uh, had to have a look at the shared notes. Is there an option to lint that will download the missing license files? Uh, no, this, these are separate steps if you mean that. So you make a lint, and depending on the output, you can say, well, now I want to download all the license files that are missing. Um, of course, you can just combine these two commands, but we don't have it in the tool. Mm, are there any significant situations where this entire model software sources have specific copyright holders and specific licenses breaks down? I mean, this model has solidified over decades. Are there any changes in legal environment, etc., which make this model outdated? I'm not aware of any, to be honest. Um, Uh, I mean, that that's the way how free software and open source software develops, right? So we don't have these silos of code, but we stand off the sh on the shoulders of giants. So and this is why this community, this whole ecosystem develops so quickly and so steadily and so with uh, such a high quality, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. We can just use components by other people, of course, respecting their conditions and making sure that these licenses are compliant but I would say it's, it's. I, I don't see a big benefit in like reducing the um, complexity of the model. I would say we have to make it simpler for people to um, to live in this world. And I think we is a it's a larger step in this direction. Oh, they are piling up the questions. Um, does the tool flag up or deal with a case where someone has manually used the spelling license? instead of license in the directory name, file name, or the header. Um, in one case, it does, yeah. We have a currently still in uh, working in project, um, progress feature, which uh, lists all the supported licenses that we have, where we have an alias for the different spelling types of American and British English. Um, Actually, I never found a case where like a tag was mistyped, like uh, for instance, the SPDX license identifier. I guess this is because most people use the tool which use American spelling for the sake of, of uh, simplicity. And I'm not aware whether the SPDX project where we uh, borrowed all these terms or from uh, deals with a different uh, spelling types. So um, I'm not sure if we have a case or where we, where we see this is really an issue. We could think about how we flag this and not mark this just as an error, which it is, uh, unfortunately, but where we give uh, pointers to the reuse tool users uh, in how to circumvent this or how to fix this, uh, fix this easily. Um, bug report, your license file, <laughs> jpeg.license is missing an ending line feed. Yeah, there is an issue. I, th I thought we we sorted this out. Uh, I'm using a... Um, development version here so it seems we have a, a regression bug here i noticed that as well and <laughs> i'm ref uh, i'm sorry that you noticed it as well and yeah hope we can fix this soon i think there's still an issue what's the legal status of reuse was this challenged or is there a lawyer who watched for this scheme i'm not sure what you mean by this um 
perhaps whoever wrote this could clarify this. Uh, or also speak up. I'm not sure whether you want to do this. I will, I will just cover another question here down below. Uh, do you have ways to audit legacy projects which already have explicit licenses over 100 of files? Um, not really. I mean, I know there are um, different conventions of conventions of like labeling these files and. Uh, I mean, Debian project, for instance, some maintainers give a lot of, put a lot of work into making sure that all the different licenses and copyright situation as well are reflected in the DEP5 file in their case. But also like the, li the Linux kernel was not unclear in a sense, they just had a whole mess of different ways how to communicate licensing and copyright. Um, I would say like these license notice headers, these two or three paragraphs, which some, somehow try to explain the license and the conditions. And um, I mean, there are some tools I know from the KDE project. It's, I think it's called License Digger, uh, which at least like in the, in the KDE sphere tries to detect these big notice headers and converts them into their corresponding SPDX license identifier, which is great. Um, I know that the Linux uh, project also has a similar tool. I think it's still in the main tree. Um, for reuse, we thought it's rather hard because it's some kind of heuristics, all right? So we don't want to interpret someone's license headers, which is often quite complex, which would, would also blow up the project size of the reuse helper tool and the complexity. So we said, well, actually, if you want to become reuse compliant, we really recommend to use these unique identifiers, which are unambiguous. And this is also the reason why we opted um, to not use these heuristics and just say, well, that's in the, I, I know it's in some extra work, but let's start from scratch or let's overhaul of the, all of this and use the modern, simpler and easy to understand way how to propagate the, the licensing and copyright of a project. Mm. So going back to the other question, the legal status, I mean, it's stuff that needs to go to court at some point, so is it going to stand up? Um, you mean because of the way how we label the files? I would say, I'm not sure whether it has been tested before. I'm not a lawyer. I didn't follow up any case law, but um, since the SPDX license identifier is around uh, for, or has been around for, I don't know, more than 10 years, of course, with growing uh, usage, we have these SPDX um, um, Bill of materials that we've seen now SPDX has recently become an ISO standard. So the way how to label or to, to communicate different kinds of information for files, like in the reuse case, copyright and licensing, in the SPDX case, you can communicate a lot of things more, is rather common standardized. And I would say it would, uh, would be uh, valid in many court cases. So I don't see a reason for this. Of course, it can become complex. Um, Let's say the, the Linux project um, longly argued about what to do with these uh, copyright notices or license notices that I just uh, talked about, um, whether they can just replace it and replace it by the SPDX license identifier and delete all the old text. I think the solution here was that they, in the fonts themselves, they deleted the text, but that they have um, an archive basically of all the old license uh, notices um, and so put them to a separate file to somehow um, archive them. Yeah, I think that was their solution. And I think for this, there's no uh, case law already out there uh, which defines this, I'm afraid. What about using common fields for binary files? Uh, for instance, uh, JPEG and PNG, uh, PNG file can include copyright. That's true. Um, it's also for um, like for Inkscape, the vector graphics files, and some others. We said um, over the different uh, development steps of reuse that we don't want to support them for different reasons. Um, first of all, it's not from the outside directly visible for people. So if I open a JPEG file, I don't I immediately see the, the license and the copyright holder. It's very simple to overwrite. Like um, if I run it through a minifier or so, um, or through a compressor, then this information is lost. If I cut the image out or modify it in some way in some other tool, 
the information might be lost. What cannot be lost is the extra dot license file, or it's really like it, it really uh, jumps in your eye, right? Um, the same is true for storing this information about copyright and licensing inside of um, of the version control system. So there were also ideas and also recent or earlier reuse versions and of the specification where we said, well, you can also put the information inside of um, the, the version control system as metadata. And we also said, well, it doesn't bring anything if I just go on a, a public uh, repository and open the file in the raw format, to copy out the text, and I don't see any copyright and licensing. It's easy to forget if you migrate to different uh, control systems. So where we said, well, let's use ideally plain text files wherever possible, as close to the files as possible, so that we avoid all these different issues. So um, follow up, I'm, so I'm not going to move to reefs without any kind of legal assurance. Even though BSD licenses are cumbersome, we know they work in court. SPDX, ISO and everything, that's not enough as a, risk, a reassurance, sorry. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I would be happy to discuss this with you later. I'm not sure whether we can cover this now here. Um, I mean, the BSD license still persists. You have still the BSD license in your file. You can still have the copyright notice, the, the big header in your file. All you need to do is to add the SPDX license identifier string and some kind of copyright information. That's all you need. And I mean, that's how the, the Linux kernel works. And <laughs> I know a, a lot of um, court cases, at least around this. Sorry, I'm not so much in the BSD field, um, but I'm sure there are also some court cases here. So it holds up in court. It's just some way how to label the information. So I'm pretty sure it would stand up in court, although I'm not a lawyer. I'm not aware of any counter case. Uh, probably there are also cases which can uh, assure you or make you more comfortable with using SPDX. Um, but again, uh, please feel up to bring up this uh, question on the mailing list. We are also uh, more lawyerish, competent people than me, and I would happy to discuss this and also um, like uh, clear up your doubts. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Do we have any more questions? I don't see any. There's some discussion here. I'm not sure how much time do we have left, or shall we just close the session then? Um, Okay, um, I mean, I will, I will go over through this um, other chat instance. We can uh, continue the discussion there. I will be around for a few minutes. Unfortunately, I have to leave afterwards uh, due to my family. Um, but otherwise, since there don't seem to be any additional questions, um, I would again like to thank you for your attention. Um, I hope I convinced you to adopt reuse in some sort, at least have a look at it. I would be really much interested in learning how the BST community thinks about this. I know like uh, operating systems distributions have quite special ways and also a lot of experience in labeling, licensing and, and copyright. And yeah, I would love to learn how we can combine the work here and also learn from each other. So please join the mailing list, please join the discussion afterwards and thank you again.